Today's episode, we are with young gun Bryce Rosenbaum out of the Portland, Oregon office in Clackamas. Bryce is one of the rising stars within Harcourt's North America and has constantly been at the top of the sales scope for many, many months and also the last number of years. He's one of the most promising young talents within the entire organization, but partly not only because of the volume of real estate that he does and the belief that he has in the real estate business, but also the way that he networks. And you'll see on this episode that Bryce sort of has something about him that people warm to him as well. Um, the other part that I'm just absolutely fascinated with on this episode is that we dive into some of the investments and flipping and, and different things that Bryce does external to just selling real estate on a day-to-day -day perspective. The the mentors that he surrounded himself with to build a business the way that he has as well, and then also monetizing the network. Okay, he's from a family, a local family that ultimately have a very big network. But there's one thing to have a very big network, but monetizing that is a very, very different element of the game. It is a very insightful episode for one of the young guns in the industry out of our Oregon business. Hopefully, you enjoy. Welcome to Rethink Real Estate. My name is Ben Brady, and this is a real estate podcast aimed to deliver sales strategies, marketing tips, and business insights from industry experts and myself to build a listing-focused business for the future. Let's get into it. Well, Bryce, welcome to Rethink Real Estate. Thank you very much, Ben. So I want to kick this off by talking about a story. You were a couple minutes late to the recording because you were talking to the UPS guy who wants to buy a second property. Is that right? That's right. Yep. So I've been chatting with him just kind of casually over the last five years. And um, I guess I'm his resource when it comes to real estate. And we're going to grab a beer this week and talk about him buying a rental property. I, I, I kind of want to dive into a little bit of this, mate, today. And I'll yep. get to that question sooner rather than later. I just, I enjoy the nature of you and what I what I mean by that is that like having seen you in the company for over the last couple of years, there's something about you where people resonate with you. They really do. They sort of levitate towards you. Now you may or may not agree with that. There might be some people behind the scenes that you piss off, you know, like I, that I don't get to see. Um, but uh, but but I think that there's there's something about you being able to uh, people feeling comfortable with you. Do you see there there's anything different that you do, or is that just who you are? Just try to be who I am, genuinely. Um, I, I don't think there's anything different that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't try to put on a front or have any sort of fluff or anything like that. Um, so I think people resonate with that, just me being a, a normal human being. I mean, I screw up all the time. I make mistakes. Um, and I accept those mistakes. I think that there's a level of ownership that you take that's above most people that we get to see. But the first thing that I want to ask you um, is just a little bit about your youth, Bryce, is that um, for the audience listening, how old are you? Uh, 27. 28 here next week. Uh, next week. Perfect. Great. You got any plans for the 28th? No. No, really? Okay. All right. You're usually, you've usually got something fun going on. But uh, yeah. anyway, I vicariously live through you, bud. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, but uh, but I guess that the um the 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 thing where I'm going with this is that from an average age perspective is that you're the youngest minus maybe a couple of other people in the office but you're the youngest by a pretty long way in your in your office really um, mm -hmm. and then and then also from an average age perspective for the industry let alone within Oregon you're quite a young person to get into real estate so how did that all happen? I was kind of forced into it honestly. Um... My dad, so I started in high school, actually. It's my senior year of high school, and I'll just quickly touch on that story. Um, I'd saved up quite a bit of money. My family owns a restaurant here locally, and so I worked always at the restaurant. Had a few kind of entrepreneurial businesses that I tried to start. Some made money, some lost a whole bunch of money. Um, and so I had a fair amount of money saved. He, My dad forced me to kind of buy a property with him. This was 2011, so the market was down. I was 17 at the time, so we couldn't place the property in my name. But... Uh, <laughs> We ended up buying it. And then my senior year, I worked on it every weekend. Uh, and then my freshman year of college, we actually flipped it, made a pretty good profit. And after that, I was kind of hooked. So I went into college already with a little bit of cash from real estate and having that mindset. Um, my parents have rental properties, so I always helped manage their rental properties, kind of was in that space, had no intention of being a realtor, but it just kind of happened. Uh, that's cool. So college, did you finish college? Finished college. Yep. Went school down in SoCal, kind of where you are. 
Oh, right. Okay, cool. Well, no wonder, you, no wonder you've got all the cool friends down here, mate. Then, uh, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I guess that, I, I guess that the thing that, you know, is, is, is that it's something that, why is it that you don't see more young people do what you've done? I know that that's a bit of an offhanded question. Um, and it's kind of, it might be a little bit of a shit question because it's quite vague, but I, I guess that why do you, why have you not, why have your friends clearly have seen what you've done? You've got a very big friend group. I know that I just know from a social perspective, when we go and do like a social function, like the, um, the cornhole tournament or sorry, what was it? The bocce ball tournament. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows you, everyone, everyone knows who you are. Um, and you've got, you've got a good group of friends around you, but there's some success amongst your friendships. There's no question about that. But why do you think more of your friends or more of the people that you know haven't done what you've done, knowing, seeing how successful you've been at it? You know, I think they also, my friends will see kind of the work that goes into it. And a lot of people um, aren't really envious of, of the day-to-day process, to be totally honest. I mean, I, you know, I'll, I was working last night until 1030 at night on the phone with a client working, had to follow up with the agent this morning at 7 a.m. And so... That just doesn't work for a lot of people my age. They'd rather clock in their nine to five, unplug their phone and know that they're done with work um, mm-hmm. and not have to take work home with them. Where I've kind of, it, my, my life and my work and personal life are totally integrated together. Um, so I don't think that's super appealing to a lot of people. I think is one factor. Another factor, um, maybe the just the fear of getting into it. Because, you know, the first 24 months of jumping into real estate is not easy. I mean, I, I, I sold, I think, five properties my first year. Um, and so if you're really needing the money to survive, uh, it's a difficult industry to get into. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question about that. So let's talk about your previous self. You know, one of the things that I've sort of, I really wanted to talk to you about is that if you like, how long is really, how long have you been in real estate now? Uh, going on what, six years, five years? Two. Okay. All right. Cool. And I guess that if you had an opportunity to talk to your younger self and when you were getting into this or, or, or sort of falling into it, as you've sort of put it, is it, is there anything that you would tell yourself to do differently from your journey so far? Because it's kind of hard to live in that in any type of, well, what would I do differently considering how, and, and again, I, I know you probably would, wouldn't, Again, you're you're a very humble person, so I'm going to say that you're successful because of the volume that you're doing and the business that you're running. I think it's a very successful real estate business that you're running at this point at age 27. But based on your success now, would you do anything differently if you were talking to your, your younger self that was getting into it? Absolutely. I think the biggest thing is just not being hesitant to ask people for help. That was one of the biggest hurdles that I had, both in terms of me reaching out to friends and family. I mean, I'm I'm third generation Oregonian. And so we have a really good network of people here. And I was so hesitant to be that guy that's calling and asking if they know anyone that wants to buy or sell or if they ever want to chat real estate, you know, to hit me up. Um, And then I've I've kind of come to the realization that people love to be requested like that. They they would like to be able to lend a, you know, a helping hand whenever they can. Uh, But you get in your head and you have these pre notions of like, Oh, I'm going to be that annoying sales guy that's constantly bothering them, that's door knocking them, that's you know doing all these things that are kind of sleazy almost. Um, yeah. And it's totally not the truth. Uh, so I think that's the first thing that I would have probably you know told my younger self. Um, the other one is is just to invest sooner. I mean, I know I purchased that one property my senior year. I didn't do anything during college. You know, just kind of focused on school and whatnot um, and enjoying the, the sunshine for a few years down there. And uh, and then, you know, after that, I got into real estate, had a pretty good lump sum of, of money saved up, but didn't invest in t- until about three years after. And I look at what would have happened if I had, you know, gone in and, and tried to invest from the get go and I'd be in a totally different position now. You mentioned entrepreneurial spirit. Did that come from your parents or was it something that you were always attracted to? Like what, what, what makes you think about, because I think that anybody that's in real estate has that entrepreneurial driven type of mentality because you have to be self-motivated to be successful right. in the industry. So where does that come from? I think it comes from my parents. Um, you know, they, they built the, the restaurants, what going on 18 years ago this summer. Um, so they always kind of had an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and I think it was just kind of instilled in me that that was kind of the the route. If you wanted to really be successful, you would own your own business, you know, kind of get away from the rat race of 
um, working at some of these large corporations and companies. And we have great employment opportunities in Oregon. You have Intel, you have Nike, you have all these wonderful companies to go and work for. Um, but it's just not for me. And I think also my ADD, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it's a little bit tough to, uh, for me to sit down and, and want to sit in a cubicle for, you know, eight hours a day. Well, let's talk a little bit about that because I think that there's, there's part of this that I admire about the way that you run things within your business is that we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about your real estate businesses shortly and the type of business it is and how you've sort of, sort of gotten it to where it is at the moment. But the thing I want to talk about is sort of the, the, it, it, the third party activities that you have that go that go on along those lines because you know one of the things that I loved like the other time I was up there um, and I and I was talking to you I'm like what are you doing this weekend well I'm actually driving out to my Airbnb I've got to do this I've got to do that I've got to get it ready because it's out near Willamette Valley right is that right yep. I ended up selling it but yes it was yeah it's out in wine country in uh, Newburgh so so talk to me about talk to me about the process of going through that with yourself is is that how do you find these opportunities on the side how do you then execute on those opportunities because you know again I'm fascinated with that primarily because you know I am a little bit of a one track mind person like when I'm in something I'll, I'll probably just be in that and then I'll wake up and smell the daisies all of a sudden and go oh shit I probably should do some investing along the way as well um or or, or do something different so talk to me about how that works in your day to day of real estate and how you think about the, the external opportunities. Sure. Yeah, I, th I think I was trying to think a little bit more about this question prior to this, and I think I operate best under some chaos. And so I, I like to have kind of a, quite a few different fires going at the same time, and that helps me think a little bit clearer almost, which sounds weird to a lot of people, but it works for me. Um, and in terms of finding properties, I mean, I'm, I work with some investors and so I'm constantly evaluating deals for them. I understand what they're looking for in terms of the back end cash flow or if it's a flip, what the you know after repair value is and things like that. Um, and I always try to have at least one project going at a time. So I have I made a goal, um, you know, when I got into real estate of, of purchasing one home a year um, and I've been fairly you know, on top of that, uh, I'm a little bit behind, about a one home behind of being where I want to be in terms of one home a year. Um, but I'm building a triplex right now, so that'll help out a little bit with the with the numbers. Do you count that as one or do you count that as three? Come on, That's talk to three. me. That's three. <laughs> three it. doors. Three I doors. It. Three different addresses. I yeah. I love it. It was yeah. funny the other day, the other day I was talking to a guy who's got big apartment buildings and like he's probably got, I don't know, a thousand doors. And he's like, No, I've got like I've got 12 properties. I'm like, oh, really? Okay, cool. No worries. Okay, so what? where are they and what are they? And he's going through it. He's like, oh, one, it's got 150 apartments. And I'm like, no, well, technically it's 150, <laughs> but whatever you like. But if you want to play it down, go for it. <laughs> yeah. No but, I'm but, but, <laughs> so, so, so there's, there's a lot that goes with that though, Bryce. There's a lot of know-how that somebody, let's say that you're, you're talking to somebody that's listening at the moment where they're like, oh, that's all good in principle, but what am I looking for in a good deal? Like, like, what do you look for in a deal? And then also, can we talk a little bit about the triplex as well and that build process of how that's going? Because that's a big process. So first question is, what do you look for in a good deal, mate? So me personally, and there's a million different ways to make money in real estate. I mean, it, it, and I hate that a lot of people out there are saying, well, you need to do multifamily or you need to do Airbnbs or you need to do flips. It's the only way to make money when all of them, are potentially profitable. Um, and so when looking at a good deal, I personally like to look at something that has an additional uh, revenue stream or a different few, you know, different uh, exit strategies. So okay. like, for example, this Airbnb, um, you know, I, I purchased it, I rehabbed it, uh, you know, renovated it. It needed just really some lipstick. It was built in 1999. So it didn't need anything structural or anything like that. It really just needed some cosmetic updates and make it look cutesy. Um, so that's kind of what I was focusing on. And I knew kind of in the back of my mind, like, okay, if this permit takes a long time to get this Airbnb, or if I'm really not very successful at it, it's taking a little bit more of my time. I have a good, a good amount of profit that I can still have a good exit strategy. Um, and so I tried to focus on that. You know, I purchased a property last year with my sister and brother-in-law. Um, you know, I really focus on the markets that I know well, I looked into investing out of state. It just scares me maybe at some point. I'd be comfortable with it, but as of now, it scares me. So I focus on the markets that I know well and uh, trying to figure out additional potential revenue stream. So this property I purchased with my sister and brother-in-law, it's on um, just about a half acre. 
uh, at some point we have the ability to build you know three additional units in the back and rent those all out sell one of those individually if we need some additional capital um, so not just being capped at that one property having additional options that's then, that's really that's really interesting that you're you're like you look at properties but then you look for what they are at the moment but then you look for the future in those as well and i love the idea of the multiple exit strategies like it was going to be an airbnb but it, there was still opportunity for upside if you decided that it that it wasn't going to be there because a lot of people catch themselves like i see people in newport beach for example bryce they they buy a property for five million dollars because it has a short-term um license on it you know and then but they go to sell it and it doesn't make any sense if that marketplace is down at that point. So I, I like the idea of that multiple exit strategy and I love the idea of the f- future potential. But tell me about these three townhomes that you're building at the moment and what that project looks like. So that was an interesting one. I um, purchased the property pretty much right when I got into real estate. Um, was able to how did I work that deal? I'm trying to remember now. I think I'd, I did a hard money loan, renovated it myself with cash, and then refinanced out and put the loan into my name. Okay. And so I had that rental property operating for the last, you know, let's say four years. Okay. Um, I knew that it, it was in an okay area, um, but it was zoned for apartments or for larger density. So I knew at some point I'd probably want to tear it down and then, you know, build and go vertical. My whole plan ended up just being expedited because last year, unfortunately, there was a fire at the property. Um, So my tenants accidentally burnt the house down. There was they were having a barbecue and uh, it's just one of these freak accidents. Thankfully, no one was hurt. Everything ended up being okay. Uh, But I was kind of forced to then tear down the property and I've started the building process Um, and building in our market similar to yours. I'm sure it takes a really long time. So yeah. I'm, I'm about a year in already. Um, granted, I don't do, I'm not focused on it every single day like I probably should be. Um, but I'm a year in and I haven't, you know, put a shovel into the ground. I totally demoed the house, got the permits, got that all approved. And then you hire an engineer, you hire surveyors, and then you start the land use application. So I'm in that process right now of giving the land use approved, getting all the plans approved, and then being able to actually go vertical. So what's the what's the advice that you would give to somebody that's listening at the moment? It's like, wow, that sounds like a great deal of stuff that you've got to figure out. Where should they start in figuring out like their projects on the side of their business? Because let's, I'm talking to you like you're a developer at the moment, Bryce. When let's face it, is that your primary income and your primary source of what you do every single day, like to the extent of ninety five percent, I would assume, is your real mm-hmm. estate business. You know, where does somebody start? thinking like going and learning a little bit more about the build, the rental side of things, the investment side of it. Do you have any resources that you use to sort of learn that part of the business or is it just by asking? Just by asking. I got really lucky in um, being around just some amazing people. So right out of college, worked for a development company. So we did, you know, land development. I was a land acquisition guy before I got my license. And so my, my job was just finding parcels that could be developed, whether it's a two lot, you know, partition or a 70 lot subdivision. And so um, knowing that there was kind of a few different extra strategies on just a piece of farmland, let's say, kind of opened my mind to it. And then we have, you know, some amazing people here at Harcourts that are really integrated into that space. They have builders there or their developers or, you know, they own a whole bunch of properties themselves. Um, So really just asking the questions. I also think podcasts are a great way. I mean, as a realtor, you spend a ton of time driving around. So um, I'll listen to, you know, the Portland real estate podcasts. I've listened to your podcast, you know, a little bit, not as much as I probably should. And I apologize, <laughs> but I'll give it back to you. Uh, here's this, a quick uh, question. Here's a quick question. Will you listen to your own podcast? Will you listen no. to this episode? <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, I probably feel like I'll have to, but I'll be cringing, you know, one eye open, just kind of looking through the hand. Um, it's it's funny when I see myself on social media or something, like it's sort of like scroll, 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 fast, fast, fast. Don't <laughs> listen to your voice. Yeah, <laughs> I'm yep, the same. Yep. That's right. So what's the, so you've got the Portland podcast that you listen to for local market knowledge. Um, yep. What else, what other podcasts? Uh, Bigger Pockets is a great oh. podcast. Um, you know, they have a whole bunch of different uh, people come on and they're, you know, do a variety of things. So you can learn all about Airbnb. There's people that do long-term rentals, short-term rentals, developers, apartment builders, so on and so forth. 
Yeah. Uh, um, offline, I think I think I'd love to talk to you about your opinion of Pace Morby, that guy who does the like the um uh, what is it the you know how he doesn't put any money down and he just acquires the loans or whatever it is. Yeah. 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 It's an interesting, it's an interesting tack, but anyway, offline. So, um, so, so there's, there's a lot of stuff that you're doing. And I think that you mentioned this and I, I've got to be honest, I never classified you as ADD because I, because at the end of the day, it sounds like you can have a multitude of things going at once and you can actually focus on it. But I want to segue back into your real estate business here, Bryce, because, you know, at the end of the day, I think that the, the the really impressive part of what you've been able to do is become a you know a, a top fifty agent within Harcourts North America. You're always consistently doing a volume of deals, and I think that a cadence of doing deals is an important part of a real estate journey because you get to really perfect the process. I, I want to talk about going from five deals your first year now to doing. I think that last year, from recollection, you did over thirty deals. I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, so. So tell me about how you've structured your business or how would you describe your business and the way that it's scaled up? A lot of it is just kind of, it snowballs, you know? Um, when I first got started, I, you know, you reach out to friends and family and it's like, oh, we want you to have a little bit more experience in order to, you know, for us to instill that trust in you. And that's totally yeah. understandable. But how do you gain experience without doing deals? Um and so I, I was fortunate to work with some builders. Um, I started as an on-site agent uh, before I even worked at Harcourts. So that gave me kind of the you know boots on the ground knowledge of how builders work. And I was able to get some deals done that way and, and gain a few clients. Um, so my job was just sitting at a sales office. It was actually a, a Airstream trailer in the middle of summer selling yes. 98 lot subdivision. And we sold uh, we sold 17 properties the first month out of that Air, Airstream trailer, um, and so I, I was hooked after that. I was like, okay, I love new construction. This is really what I want to focus on because the properties have to sell. It's not like yep. you're out there hunting for new listings. It's you got 98 homes. They need to sell. The builder might be sending secret shoppers out to you, so you better be on your game every single day. Um, so that that's kind of how I started my business is is working with builders and and getting a, a few deals under my belt. And then I was able to have a little bit more confidence probably in myself and also people had a little more confidence in me um, where I could start reaching out to friends and family. Uh, and I'm also starting to get to the age where a lot of my friends are starting to buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And I, I guess that I guess that the other part of this that I, I'm curious about as well is when it comes down to the relationship with the builders, do you think that if you were starting again, would that be some advice that if you weren't in the in the building side of things, it sounds like the building, the development company that you work for, the builders side, really good way to cut your teeth into the industry and just understand how it works. Now, don't get me wrong, the new construction game is just as cyclical as traditional real estate with the resale side of it, I guess, you know, depending on market conditions. But your a lot of your business now uh, is is there's a lot of resale, there's buyer side, and there's new construction as well. What would you say the breakdown of your business is at the moment from resale, new construction, and everything along those lines? Um, List-wise, I'm about half uh, new construction currently. Um, And then, you know, buyers, I have three buyers buying new construction currently under contract and a few more that are resale. Um, So I would say it's probably 75 uh, 25 uh, on the okay. buy side, resale to new construction. Um, and then it's probably about 50 50 uh, on the list side for new construction. Right, right. Now, there's a part of this um, process that I think that there's one standout thing that if somebody was asking me separately to you being on this podcast, said, what makes Bryce differently? Uh, what makes him different to some of the other people that are in the network? I think that you've mentioned it a couple of times now that you've reached out to friends and family and you've leveraged that, but there's a different perspective. I I know some of the most popular, nicest people in the world that are realtors that are horrible at real estate. And what I mean by that is that they're, they're, they've got great relationships, but they don't know how to monetize those relationships without coming across as a salesperson douchebag, right? As, as, we, as we've seen a lot of people do. Um, mm-hmm. Could I ask, how do you monetize your relationships, um, being friends, family, all that stuff, but how do you do it without coming across in that salesy type of perspective that you've already mentioned? So this is kind of the same way that I approach any client, whether they're friends, family, or I just met them is I just treat them like a normal human being. I really, I don't hard sell anyone. 
I tell people up front, listen, if you want to work with me, great. If you don't want to work with me, no worries. I still can be, you know, a sounding board. If you still want to call me and ask for advice, I'm still happy to help. Um, I don't sign buyer agency agreements. Um, it's, it hasn't come back to bite me yet. I know some people really disagree with that. Um, but I just, I try to treat everyone as I would want to be treated. Um, you know, the golden rule, and I'm not trying to be cliche or anything like that, but, uh, you know, last year I sold a, a property for, uh, $250,000 out in John Day. It was a, a pretty time intensive property. Um, as a veteran client, I really had to, uh, walk him through a lot of different things. I put the same amount of effort, uh, into that property as I did my $2.3 million sale. Um, and the, the thinking is that like, they're still individuals, they still have their own personal network of people. And so as long as I focus on the individual, uh, and I focus just on helping them, I don't focus on the deal. I don't focus on the money, everything else will come. And it's worked out for me that way. So when you're reaching out to say you're reaching out to a, you know, family member or a friend, when you were first starting to do it, what did that conversation look like? I know you just mentioned that, that, um, you know, Hey, look, you can use me or not use me, but did you literally like, if I'm calling you and you're a friend of mine that I've known for years and now I'm in real estate or I'm into that, I'm into residential resale real estate is that, is it a call to say, Hey Bryce, um, it's Ben here. How you doing? You know, a bit of shit talk. Hey, the reason I'm calling is that I just want to just put on the radar that I'm in real estate now. Is that how it looks or, or what, what was those, what were those original calls? Because the reason I'm asking you, Bryce, is because I know you would have thought about it. I know you would have thought about what to say to them. How is it a way that I'm not going to be too intrusive? I didn't. I didn't do it at all in the beginning. I was okay. just terrified to call people because I didn't want to be that salesy guy. Now it's it's a lot easier. I call them. Hey, listen, I, I we haven't talked for a while. I don't know if you know. I'm you know, I'm a residential realtor. I'm also an investor. If you ever want to get together, have a coffee or beer and talk about real estate, whether it's, you know, your real estate goals, if you ever are thinking about investing, if you're happy with your current living situation, if you want to maybe explore what other options would look like, I'd love to take you out for a coffee or beer. There's no obligation for you to use me. It's really going to be a low stress environment. And I think right. that's okay. a pretty approachable way of, you know, of people to absorb that. Yeah, no, that I, I I think so because I think that there's a lot of people out there that are, are terrified like you were, but then when they start to do it, they see that it's really a really warm call in that sense. Now, yeah. speaking speaking of something, speaking of something that I, I want to talk about something, um, uh, I want to talk about Larry's business a little bit because you've had an opportunity recently um, where a gentleman that you'd worked with previously um, had sort of has literally retired. And when I say retired, you know, Larry, you know, so, so does anyone really ever retire from real estate? Larry made a conscious effort to retire. Like he's legitimately, I'm hanging up the, I'm hanging up the real estate hat. It's done. And like, he's a legend in the industry. The guy probably knows every single person in all of Oregon, you know, that does real estate, all of that type of stuff. The guy's a ledge. Um, yep. But you came to, you, you and Larry came to me about sort of a little bit of a transition plan and how that's going to work and you sort of taking over some of what, like they're going to be people that reach out to Larry. Um, so therefore he was going to hand them over to you and some type of referral deal and things along those lines. Can you talk about that and talk to me about how it's gone and what the difficulties have been? Has it been worth it? All of those things. Absolutely worth it. And, and Larry was my mentor, you know, since we started on the project, um, our, our first subdivision, I think was about three and a half years ago. Um, so I just kind of, fell into working with Larry um, and we hit it off right away. And so that was the biggest blessing that could have happened to me. And, um, you know, there's definitely been some challenges with him leaving. You know, I have huge shoes to fill. He is Larry the legend. He's the most classy, like gentleman of a, of a man you can ever meet. He makes uh, me feel bad about, he makes me feel bad about myself. Like if me you meet too. Larry, you're like, you're like, I, I kind of like, I'm a bad human. Like Larry's so nice. <laughs> yeah. So nice. And just always dressed to the nines. He's got the Italian custom shirt and yeah, just a wonderful guy. But so it, there's, there's big shoes to fill. Um, I, th I would think, or I would, excuse me, I would say that the most challenging things are um, making sure that I'm giving the same level of service that Larry was providing them. And everyone has different styles. And so I've really had to 
talk with Larry and still use him, utilize him as a mentor um, on how to handle certain clients. Because okay. some people are really wanting me to reach out to them, you know, almost on a weekly basis, if not sooner than that. Other people, they don't want me to reach out at all. They're going to reach out to me when they're ready. And if I reach out, it could be that, you know, they will never use me. Um, and so just kind of knowing how everyone uh, reacts to different sales styles is is a challenge in itself. Um, and then also just kind of making that transition, you know, over to someone. He's been in real estate for over 50 years. And so a lot of these people, he's worked with the grandparents, the parents, the kids, and maybe even the grandkids, you know. And so this has been their guy. And so now with transitioning and it's like some young kid that, you know, maybe doesn't know as much uh, as far as what they're perceiving as Larry, the legend does. So yeah. I think that was a, that's been a pretty tough challenge as well. Um, but so far it's been good and I'm, it's been a wonderful blessing. I love his clients uh, that I've been able to retain and work with. And uh, you know, we have Larry and I are definitely something I, I picked up from him, but I already kind of had it a little bit was um, just ethically doing the right thing. I mean, there's so many opportunities um, on the new construction side. This is a good example of agents sh or buyers showing up, um, them not really saying they have an agent, but it's, you know, a, maybe a little bit implied that they're working with this person, but they just straight up say, I don't really have much loyalty to them. Hmm. I'd be happy to work with you. Every single time, Larry was like, no, we're going to call that agent. We're going to let them know their buyer stops by. If they're still working together, they should write the offer. Yeah. And there was no sort of obligation for that, but it's just about, you know, doing the right thing and, and knowing that, you know, deals come and go um, and you can't capitalize on every single one. That's such a Larry, like, like just knowing Larry a little bit, not as well as what you do. That is such a Larry comment to say that, like he won't jeopardize the future for the sake of a quick buck. There's no question, but no. I guess that how have you, because the transition, just so that people don't get this mixed up, the transition has only very recently happened. You have right. built your own significant business prior to Larry stepping out of out of his role, and then now it might have might the volume may pick up a little bit from him, you know, sort of segueing you in. I, I guess that how have you made sure it doesn't cannibalize the business that you've already built? And because I know that you, I know the type of person you are, Bryce, is that Larry calls you about a client, you're probably going to give that client a little extra service because ultimately you don't want to let Larry down. So, you know, how are you making sure that you're being able to service both sides of it now? That's been a challenge, honestly. Um, and there's been a few investors that I'm working with right now that were Larry's clients that are pretty time intensive. Um, mm -hmm. And so I have started to have that conversation of, hey, it, it's getting to the point, and I've talked with Larry here recently, it's getting to the point where maybe I need to put a little bit of boundaries up. And, you know, and really, because I, I do, I have my own business, I have my own client base. I would love to retain and uh, make sure to service all of his clients to the best of my abilities. But maybe some of them have a little bit higher expectation than what I can provide. Um, and so it, it, it has been a challenge, but, you know, I, I love working. I really do. Like, I, I love being the last person in the office. I'm weird like that. Um, like every single time I go on a trip, I still try to work a little bit. I was in at the coast last weekend uh, and spent Sunday instead of driving home immediately, spent, you know, going and checking out open houses and seeing what's going on in that marketplace because I have a little five lot subdivision coming up over there. So I'm just constantly love. I love the grinds. It, it never gets old. Um, so I don't know. I, I It hasn't gotten to the point where it's too much. Okay. And that it's, you know, yeah. Hopefully some people, that so, question. no, that, that, that's a good question. Good. I, I love the fact that you spoke about maybe putting some boundaries up because I think a lot of people struggle with that, Bryce, because it's certainly when yeah. you've got that young, hungry mentality you know, in the sense that you just, it's a, it's a little bit more people pleasing than it is like, well, what's the end result? Am I going to get paid out of this? The, it, like, so I think that being conscious about that is the first step in all of it. But final, final sort of um, little touch on things is that I guess that, you know, we've spoken a little bit about the questions about, you know, the podcast that you listen to, the mentor in Larry. Is there anyone else that has had influence like coaches or anything like that? Is there any training that you do to sharpen your skill set or is that just something that you learned in the early days that now you've refined? Probably something in the early days that I've refined in terms of sales training. Um, 
And I'm really not, I don't think of myself as a salesperson at all. I've, right. I, I'm really, when it comes to actually trying to sell someone on something, I'm not very good at it. I just point out the facts. I tell them why I think it could be a good property for them and why it couldn't be a good property. Because at the end of the day, I'm not living there. They, they need to make that decision themselves. And I'm here to guide them and to be their you know emotional support realtor throughout the process, really. Um, but yeah, in terms of other mentors, there are absolutely a lot of people that have contributed to kind of my success and, and who I am and who I'm striving still to be. Um, Larry is obviously an amazing mentor. I still talk to him probably on a weekly basis, even though he's enjoying himself down in Arizona now. Uh, Bob Sissel, another wonderful agent, fantastic mentor. We share an office together. It was Bob, Larry, and I. And we did this thing every month that we called the Save the World. Um, and so we got together at a high-end steakhouse somewhere in Portland, tried to change it up. And we would just talk shop, talk real estate, what's going on and in our local economy, in our global economy, what are some of the struggles that we're dealing with, both business and personal life. And both those guys have been in the industry for, you know, I think Bob's been in for what, over 35 years. Larry was in it for over 50 years. So they have a wealth of knowledge that they've been able to provide for me. Stay um, away from the Sissel driver. Stay away from the <laughs> Sissel driver. That thing yeah. will get you. <laughs> it will get you. Yeah. I try to limit myself to one Sissel driver at those Save the World events. <laughs> 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 uh, but mate, like that's, that's, that's so in like, I really do believe that it's something that's missed in the younger generation of things is that they believe that they can have a relationship with people via podcast, you know, like, like it, it's interesting. And again, I'm not saying that uh, in any way, shape or form I'm to the caliber of those two gentlemen that you mentioned, but it's funny. Like you'll get people that say to you all the time, or, oh, or oh, Ben, you're a mentor. I'm like, hang on. I've never even met you. I don't know who you are. It's like, no, well, you know, I listen to your podcast. Well, no, but actually reaching out and asking the questions and things along those lines, you know, is really important and you've made a conscious effort to because a lot of young people want to obviously prove some of the older people wrong that the young people can't do it so they probably wouldn't reach out to the older generation of people that have been doing it forever and and have been like and all of that wealth of knowledge that you've been able to collect from those two gentlemen two stellar gentlemen but also two people that have been top performers like like i've got I'm keep looking at Bob Sissel's face here. We've got that big record that he got for being in the top 20. It's sitting in yeah. the office because we we haven't sent it to him yet. And you know, he's number six for the entire company last year. Like the guy, right. the guy just kills it. But then it's also on the development side. So you've obviously found people that you you've looked up to, you've gone to them, you've asked them as many questions as possible. But then that leads me to the next thing is that what does the future look like for you, Bryce? Is it being one of those top performers that does their own developments and 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 everything on the side? Or does it look different for you? Do you have any anything different that you want to want to achieve? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. To be totally honest with you, I don't know what it looks like. Um, I, I know that I'll be selling real estate for at least the next 30 years. That's, that's one thing I do know. Um, whether it's I'm developing and, and working with builders, I would love to go that route. Um, but I also love working with individuals, you know. Uh, I I think that the the emotional impact that you can make on someone's life when you're helping them sell their first home that they purchased or purchase their first home is unlike any other feeling. And so um, you lose a little bit of that emotional side uh, when working with builders. It's really just numbers based and business. Um, so I like having both sides of the coin a little bit, uh, but definitely, you know, I, in terms of investing, I still want to try to buy one property a year. Um, at some point, you know, Bob has, I think, over 60 rentals. And so if I could get to that stage uh, where I love selling real estate, but I do it just because I love it, not because I need to put food on the table, that would be amazing. Well, mate, I think that that's a, that's a wonderful way to round out the episode. But I want to I want to I want to quickly make a quick note and you're probably sick and tired of people saying this but I just want for people's sake so that they know your parents restaurant where that is beautiful beautiful scape by the way name of restaurant where it is so that if people are in Portland they can check it out yep stone cliff inn it's in uh, Oregon City on Clackamas River Drive now Reason I say that, first of all, food spectacular. Sit upstairs. I really liked upstairs when I sat up there. Um, great bar as well. But 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 the thing that I want the thing I want to point out is that this is where Twilight was filmed. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Have you I'm seen still, the photo of me and Kristen Stewart? Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen I'm it? Still, 
I have. You've shown me. You've shown okay. it to me. But it's also isn't there a photo? There's a there's a photo. There's a couple of photos in the restaurant. Is there are. There? There's a few. There's a few photos in the restaurant. Mostly the photos in the restaurant are about the history of Carver. So the little town that I grew up in. My dad grew up in. My grandfather grew up in his Carver. So it's a old school logging and uh, quarry town. And so most of the photos inside are just kind of. Uh, mementos to the history of Carver. Uh, but on the outside, as you're going back into the woods a little bit, we have those plaques for Twilight. And you can go see the seven different scenes that have been filmed at Stonecliff. Really, really cool. And when I was there, like it's one of those things that I've watched Twilight, but I'm like, I don't know if I should admit that in out in the open. But um, but but either way is that is that it's it, it you get there and you sort of like, oh, I can see it. I can actually see it now. But either yeah. way, mate, thank you for joining us on Rethink Real Estate. It's been a great episode. Congratulations on all your success in such a young age. But at the same time, is that mate, I, I I'm just excited to see the le- level of consistency that you have for the years to come, mate, because I think that you're a force to be reckoned with, certainly in Oregon. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ben, for having me on. Thanks Thanks for joining us, mate. So about 75% of our audience hasn't liked, followed, or subscribed to our podcast. It would mean the world to us, and it would help this podcast more than you know to expand our reach if you were to like, follow, or subscribe on any of the platforms that you're watching or listening on. Thanks again.